So I think this scripture is a perfect example of the mercy and unconditional love of God. Although God acknowledges the acts of Elijah has committed, um, he lets him know there's a path to reach forgiveness and acceptance under him. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets of Baal with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down on the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Mm, angels have been on my mind this week. When I saw this photo on Facebook uh, just a few days ago, I saw angels. It turns out that this is actually a photograph of drops of water dripping into a puddle, raindrops dripping into a puddle taken with a super slow motion camera. But I thought that it was blown glass when I first saw it shaped to look like angels. I think I saw angels because angels have been on my mind this week. This is the first, as Brenda said in her introduction, the first of a four-part series inspired by the Reverend Otis Moss III. And in this series, we are going to look at four stories from the scriptures, four stories of people who have in some way been not okay, who have in some way said, I am not okay. Today we look at a story from the prophet about the prophet Elijah. And uh, Elijah, we want to remember, is a Jewish prophet, an important prophet at the Jewish Seder. A place is set for him because his return is that important to the Jewish people. And in this story, Elijah in a sense, says, I am not okay. So I'm going to talk about Elijah, but I'm also going to talk about angels, because I can't talk about this story without talking about angels. I realized that at the Monday morning Bible study, and so since Monday, angels have been on my mind. The story we heard C.C. read just a moment ago is a middle section of a much bigger story and takes two chapters to tell in First Kings. Two chapters. There's been a drought in Israel for three years. Three years of drought in the desert region means three years of grazing land drying up, three years of food production falling down. And the question that people are asking is one that surprises me. It's not why. They're not asking why is this happening. They're asking who. Who is causing this? Who is responsible for this drought? And who can end this drought? Is it the great Baal, Baal of the heavens who's in charge? Or is Yahweh in charge? Well, on one hand, we have Elijah who is saying, uh, it's not Baal, it's Yahweh. Elijah says it's Yahweh. In fact, Yahweh's name, uh, Elijah's name literally means 
Yahweh is God. So he says that Yahweh is in charge. And on the other hand, we've got the folk uh, backed by Queen Jezebel and King Ahab, who uh, huge numbers of Hebrews who are saying Baal is the one who's in charge. So a showdown happens at Mount Carmel. On one hand, we have a few hundred prophets of Baal. And on the other side, we have Elijah. In a contest worthy of a Cecil B. DeMille film, I will let you read the details for yourself. Elijah proves that Yahweh is truly God. It is such an over-the-top contest that it is almost comical to me. And so the line at the end of the contest where Elijah tells the crowd gathered there to grab the prophets of Baal, and then he kills them, hundreds of them, seems over the top too. Now we get to the part of the story that was in today's reading. When King Ahab tells Queen Jezebel what Elijah has done, that he's killed the prophets of Baal, that he has killed the prophets that she was backing, she gets angry. And she sends a message to Elijah. Elijah, I'm going to kill you. And when the queen issues a death threat, it's a death threat you take seriously. So Elijah is frightened. He is so scared by this threat that he flees into the wilderness. He goes into the countryside with his servant and then leaves his servant behind and goes into the countryside further by himself. Fear drives him there. And when he finally gets alone in the wilderness, things start to change for him. Alone in the wilderness, Elijah plants himself under a broom tree, and his fear turns into depression. There's no explanation about why this shift happens. At the Bible, story, at the Bible study, we speculated that perhaps it was guilt or shame that did this. Perhaps Elijah felt guilty for killing hundreds of people, even if they were prophets of Baal. Elijah does pray, I am no better than my ancestors. Whatever the cause, this depression is deep. This depression is so deep that Elijah asks Yahweh to take his life. And he lays down and falls asleep. While he is sleeping there under the broom tree, an angel comes, touches him, and tells him, get up and eat. You see why angels have been on my mind this week. Miraculously, there is food and water there, and Elijah partakes, and then he lays down again, goes to sleep again. And the angel comes a second time, wakes him up, and reminds him to eat. He does, and he's strengthened for the journey ahead. One of my favorite conclusions drawn from this story is never underestimate the spiritual power of a nap and a snack. Elijah needed a nap and a snack. He was so not okay, he needed an angel as well. He needed someone to get the food ready for him. He needed someone to help him. In this moment when he couldn't manage on his own, his anger and guilt and depression were so great, he needed outside help. And as we were discussing the story in the Bible study, Joy Barnett was reminded of the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Now, I'm guessing that most of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life here in the congregation Almost all of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life. If you haven't, go see It's a Wonderful Life. And I apologize for any spoilers that are coming up in this sermon if you haven't seen the movie. But in the movie, Jimmy Stewart plays George Bailey, a man who has always hoped to leave Bedford Falls and go out and see the world. Instead, the Great Depression hits. And through a series of 
events that I won't spoil. Fear that the family run savings and loans will collapse keeps him from leaving. This fear leads to a despondency that leads to a suicidal depression. And that's when Clarence shows up. Clarence, the angel, who helps George see that he actually has a wonderful life, even with all of its heartaches and hardships. In his fear and depression, George needed an angel. He needs someone to help him see what he could not see on his own, that he is surrounded by love, that he has more friends than he can count, and as the movie concludes, no man is a failure who has friends. Friends are important. In fact, friends are the most common form of angels that God sends us when we are not okay. And Clarence is not the only angel in this movie. Jim Reddy says that Mary is the true hero of the story. He notes that the movie starts off with Mary praying for God to be with George. Her prayer, along with the prayers of others who join her, are the catalysts for the angel Clarence being sent to George. Mary is the one who sees beauty in the old house that they make into their home. Mary is the one who offers their $2,000 of honeymoon money to keep the savings and loan afloat during the run on the bank. When George is depressed by his friends moving onward and upward in the world and thinks he's a disappointment to his wife because of it, Mary makes it clear that she didn't want to marry anybody else in town. And Mary is the one who goes all over town asking for help for her husband. Uncle Billy even says at the end of the movie, Mary did it, George. Mary did it. And if you watch the movie carefully, you'll see that Mary doesn't want the credit. She did it. She did it for love. Referring to this still from nearly the very end of the movie. Riddies invites us to notice where Mary is in the frame of this picture. Mary is in the background and still important as she sort of rises above everyone else. She's watching over George as she has been all these years. She is as much a guardian angel of George as Clarence ever was. May we all be blessed by Mary's in our lives. There's one more story about fear and angels that I want to talk about because fear doesn't always lead to depression. Sometimes fear can turn us into monsters. So I'm going to look again at the Epiphany story. And I know I preached on the Epiphany story last week. I hope you don't mind looking at it again, because our sacred texts are rich, and there's always more truth and light to break forth from them. You might remember that Matthew says that when the Magi stopped in Jerusalem to inquire about the newborn king, Herod, the current king of Judea, was frightened. Nadia Boltzweber says that we can look at this story as being the story of two men. Herod, who is a ruler on a throne of power, and Joseph, who is a peasant in an unconventional marriage. This is what she says about the two men. <clears throat> one man is powerful and one man is not. And yet the text only describes one of these men as being afraid. And it wasn't the peasant. Matthew's gospel tells us that King Herod made the Magi tell him where the baby was because he was frightened. Frightened by a baby. 
threatened by a horoscope and a newborn. And this fear that his position in life is so tenuous that it must be fortified by sacrificing whoever it takes is not theoretical, by the way. This Herod guy literally killed off two of his own sons because he felt threatened by them. His own sons. Fear that what he had would be taken away or fear of not getting what he wanted, turned him into a monster. So much so that when he can't quite locate the right baby, the one who is so threatening to him, he just sends for all the children to and under in and around Bethlehem to be killed. Take that in. This is what fear does. Fear disguises itself in so many ways, as greed, as hate, as isolation, as addiction. The list is endless. But at the end, fear is at the root of it. And while you and I might not be murderous tyrants, none of us is free from the effects of fear in our lives. It keeps us isolated and small, and it steals away joy and possibility. But in Joseph, we see a different kind of man than Herod. Joseph is not afraid. An angel came from God and spoke love, was love, embodied love, sought to protect love like a divine can of compressed air. And this cast out Joseph's fear so that he could function in a way he was intended to. And here's one clue, one way that we can know that Joseph was not afraid. He didn't bat an eye when the angel said that his baby and wife weren't safe, so he should take his family to Egypt. With fear cast out, Joseph was able to believe it was possible that God's redemptive work can happen anywhere, even in Egypt. With fear cast out, Jesus, Joseph no longer had to see everything through the lens of what it was in the past. With fear cast out, he was able to beat a king, protect his wife and child, and preserve that which is good in the face of tyranny. Herod's fear caused death, and Joseph's fearlessness protected life. Of course, the irony is that Herod feared this baby for all the wrong reasons. Christ, the Christ child, did not knock Herod off his pathetic throne. History took care of that. Now, Jesus of Nazareth did not overthrow Rome. He laughed at Rome. He saw Rome for what it was, temporary, fleeting, harsh and demanding and tyrannical, yes, but temporary. And this child, protected by the songs of angels and the heart of his mother and the fearlessness of his father, came to free the people free us from the shackles of sin and fear. Gospel people are free people, and free people are dangerous people. Free people aren't ruled by fear. Free people see Rome for what it is. And you know what? There are angels hovering around us, good people of God. There are messengers of love all around. And again and forever, they say, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Fear in the heart of God, there is more for in the heart of God, 
there is enough love to cast out fear. In the heart of God, there is enough love to cast out fear. May the Herods of the world take note. Amen.